behalf of Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, Teamwork Arts and Asia Society New York, we welcome you back for our second session of JLF New York Virtual Festival. Instamatic American Masala. So we Saran in conversation with Yogi Suri. In his latest book, Instamatic, celebrated Michelin star chef Suvir Saran appeals to two of our most basic senses, taste and of sight, starting with the premise that the culinary experience transcends cultural boundaries. In his series of 75 photographs taken with his iPhone, Saran focuses his lens on everyday sights and transforms them into images that carry a message of our common humanity and the global nature of everyday experience. Saran has published Masala Farm, American Masala, 125 Classics from My Home Kitchen, and Indian Home Cooking. In conversation with Yogi Suri, founder of Milap Publications, he shares his vision of how food can be a medium to look deeper into issues that are common concern of all people. Suvir Saran has been regarded as a legend in New York City food circles, having garnered a Michelin star at Devi, a first for Indian cuisine in North America. As chair of Asian culinary studies for the Culinary Institute of America, he travels extensively to teach audiences. He has penned three cookbooks, Indian Home Cooking, A Fresh Introduction to Indian Food, American Masala, 125 New Classics from My Home Kitchen, and Masala Farm Stories and Recipes from an Uncommon Life in the Country. He recently released his fourth book, Instamatic, a chef's deeper, more thoughtful look into today's Insta world. Yogi Suri is an Indian publisher. He's the founder of Milap Publications, an independent publishing house that publishes not only traditional books, but also books in digital, as well as new and emerging media. In parallel to his publishing career, Suri has also been the joint editor of the Daily Milap, India's largest and oldest Urdu newspaper. Mila Publications has published Instamatic, the new book by internationally acclaimed Michelin star chef Suvi Saran. The conversation will be followed by Q&A. Please feel free to send in your questions. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Do follow our pages, JLF Lit Fest, across Twitter, Instagram and Facebook to get notified on all our upcoming sessions. Do visit our website, jlflitfest.org slash New York for the full schedule and information about our speakers. In these unusually difficult times, we have struggled to bring to you JLF New York without charging a registration fee. Please donate as generously as you can to ensure a free, seamless and continuous flow of knowledge. You can do so by visiting our website, jlflitfest.org slash New York. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present Instamatic, American Masala. So we Saran in conversation with Yogi Suri. Over to you, Yogi. Thanks, Kritika. And Savir, here we are at JLF New York. And uh, Instamatic is basically, you know, Savir's journey, uh, his, his life, his work, his thoughts, basically what makes him tick. So before we get into the book, we'll be talking about things that really got Suvir to where he is. And uh, of course, what makes him tick off other people is another session for which I can be reached privately. Uh, but uh, so, so Suvir, you write about New York in Instamatic, and I quote you here that it's, it's a city of dreams, a city of hope, home to mad brilliance and mad wicked madness. New York is a city full of life. If life were a beautiful city, it would be New York City. And so virtually welcome to New York. Thank you. So, so most people know you as a chef, even though you've written four very widely popular books. But let's start from where educational journey began. Tell us a little bit about your school. Very quickly. I, I was a lucky man, a lucky boy to have been sent to modern school with Sant Vihar. Modern school was my uh, father's alma mater. He went to Barakamba Road. I went to Sant Vihar and this school was a school coming of age with vision, with a grand uh, scheme of how to educate kids. 
in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and that's when I was there, between the late 70s and uh, early 90s. Nothing could have uh, matched that education. I had teachers that were uh, perhaps not as uh, equipped to educate in long resumes, but they had the largest hearts and greatest minds and broad vision of what a human being should be. And with their tutelage given to us as, as kids in that school, I may not have gotten the highest grades in my class, but I was given utmost freedom to be that uh, madman who had, uh, in the, when all other kids were doing five subjects in 12, 11th and 12th grade, I took eight subjects in school. The principal and the teachers allowed me to bunk classes, to miss certain subjects on certain days. They knew this mad kid has some formula that will work. They took the risk. I made the uh, madness happen. And truth be told, I arrived in New York City, a mediocre student of modern school, started getting A pluses in his classes in New York City at the School of Visual Arts. And I thought, oh my God, what am I, how can I be this brilliant? But the education of modern school, the education of India, the empowerment Indians gave to education in that period of time, uh, spoke through my uh, acts that I uh, did in New York City, people fell in love. And I always said, this is India, this is nothing about me. All my classmates were only brighter than me, smarter than me, more uh, engaging and brilliant than I was. And yet I was getting across to people in ways that they hadn't imagined earlier. And I think that's modern school that made all of it happen. Brilliant. Now, and, uh, so so from, uh, from modern, you go to art school, New York. And uh, so, so, you know, there's a chap who told me once that mm, art is like sex. Most of it is pretty bad. And the good stuff is, well, unaffordable. So, 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 so tell us about this passion for art that you have your drive with photography and your time at New York? So in between Delhi and New York, I went to the Sir JJ School of Art in Bombay, where I was for a year. And then I went, I ran from there to New York. Uh, Sir JJ School of Arts was a hallowed institution with uh, the emperor with no clothes. There was nothing there. There was no there there. And um, I arrived and all they could talk to me was, what are you? Aap kya hai? And I would say, human being. And they would say, nee, what are you? And I said, what do you mean, what am I? And they would want to know what my uh, ethnic makeup was within the Indian context. Kashmiri hai, Punjabi hai, kya hai? And I would say, you know, mix Uttar Pradesh and Punjab ka chora. And they weren't happy because they, when I'm clean shaven, which I'm not today, I'm even paler in color. And for them, that was very exotic in India. And they would generalize me and ghettoize me into compartments that tick, tick, tick. He's a Punjabi, he's a spoiled brat, he doesn't speak good Hindi, all those things that ticked. And I was ticked off that they were not even giving me a chance. They weren't wanting to know me. So from that bad experience at a great institution, I arrived in New York City and life just took on. It was art was everywhere. If you could smell art, the nasty streets of New York City where uh, dirt and filth and garbage were just being rotting because nobody had the money in that New York of 1993. The smells and scents had an art form entirely their own. That you could write books and novels about what you smelled. And uh, the, the rats that were half rat, half pig, giant rats jumping the streets. New York was a very different city to what it is today when I arrived in 99. The art world, the artists were mad, they were poor, they were full of uh, hope. They were true artists. When you're poor, the best artists won't. When you have nothing to look forward to, you have art to create. And that's what New York was when I arrived in 1993. And it was the most exciting moment to be in New York because all of us were struggling together, rejoicing together, and hoping for a better tomorrow. Rich, poor, uh, artists, non-artists, scientists, bankers, it was depressed. And we all enjoyed the character of New York City a great city, a mosaic of humanity that was shining and brimming, knowing that tomorrow will be a new day. It was a Vedic way of living. In the Vedas, they say, enjoy today, tomorrow is not in your hands, give today the fullest. New York was living with that uh, sensibility. So, uh, so, so, uh, so, so you were this budding artist in New York. So how did you suddenly become this amazing chef that everybody was talking about? 
I arrived in New York and I went to restaurants, Indian and non-Indian, the ones I could afford, others friends took me to, very expensive ones to very reasonable ones. And I was still craving Indian ghar ka khana, the food of our Indian homes, where simplicity takes on incredible nuance and airs. It becomes a thing of ethereal brilliance. That food was nowhere to be found, neither in our Indian restaurants, nor in the cookbooks that have been written with the Indian uh, print on them. Our Indian cookbook writers were cooking butter chicken and dal makhani and paneer oh. makhani and kadai chicken and murg masallam. And I'm like, that's not what we eat every day. This stupid Indian boy that never ate all these karkarelas and bharwa tinda and bindi and zimikan, parval ki sabzi, all of a sudden at 20 was craving these dishes that I'd seen my mother, grandmother and our by, uh, neighbor their relatives and neighbors all eating every day. There was something simple about them that lack of fanfare, lack of oil and butter cloaking them down that my artistic sensibilities were craving. And so I would get on the phone with my mother and I would say, mom, teach me how to make an achar, teach me how to make that chuki matar ki sabzi, teach me how to make the matar ki puriya, teach me how to make zimikan ke kofte, how to be da dadi kaise bharwa karele banati thi. And with my poor father's bureaucratic income, he wasn't a corrupt bureaucrat, so there wasn't much income. They, uh, I would get onto phone calls, spend a lot of dollars on a phone bill every month. And my mother taught me cooking. She also wrote recipes down and shipped them to me. And I started cooking. And when I started cooking, I'm Indian, I started sharing. I lived in an apartment with a roommate who was blind. His parents had picked the Indian boy because something told them Indians are hospitable. So he was legally blind. He could see three feet like I could many years later. And so they took the Indian boy to be his roommate in a penthouse apartment on the Upper West Side with amazing grand views and incredible terrace. We entertained every night. I cooked, I cleaned, I fed people. My poor father and mother paid for it. They must have thought he does drugs, he smokes, he does hot sex. Who knows what they thought I was doing with the money. I was feeding people, people rich, famous, uh, celebrities, uh, everyday people, classmates, people 30, 40, 50 years older started coming to my New York City uh, apartment I shared with a roommate to eat some of the best meals that Manhattan was being uh, uh, shown at that moment in time. And word spread that this young cook, young kid cooks some of the best food in Manhattan. And the next thing I knew, uh, Elizabeth Bumiller, who years ago used to be the Washington Post, uh, uh, Delhi uh, uh, head and her husband Stephen Weissman was the New York Times head for the India. They, uh, he was celebrating his 50th birthday and Elizabeth got to know from Bim Bissell, the owner of Fab India, that family, that Suveer makes the best food in New York. I get a call, will you cook my husband's 50th birthday meal? I said, I'm not a caterer, I'm a student. She said, you cook the best meals, you cook for 50 people, you cook for 100 people, all from your kitchen, can you do it for us and we'll pay you? And that was my first catering gig and that put me on the map with uh, Abe Rosenthal, who was the head of the New York Times, uh, calling and saying, oh, it's better than any Indian food I've eaten in India. It's so light, it's so fresh, it's so delicate, it's so nuanced, it's fiery, it's sweet, it's uh, bland, everything that Indian food is all about. How do you manage this? I said, it's the food of the Indian home. And that's what put me on the culinary stage in New York. Well, and, and, and that's always been you, you know, generous, like without thinking of yourself, you're feeding so many people. I mean, that's it's, Indian, it's not me. There's nothing new to me. I think it's the, uh, that's the uh, beauty and bane of India. There are poor are not in arms uh, fighting the rich. Our rich are uh, perhaps not uh, kind enough to uh, be generous to our poor or generous enough, but they each respect the other. They let each other uh, even come into each other's space. And that's the beauty and bane of India. Bane because one day our poor should fight and want their uh, lot in life to be changed by force if we don't do it naturally for them. But till then, it's the beauty of India that you can be safe on the Indian street. The poor will share that one piece of bread they have with you with a smile and tell you you're looking good, your diamond shines bright and have a good day and they don't shoot you dead out of anger. That's the beauty of India and it's been. So, so, so while, while you're in New York, you you got the restaurants going. So from there, you went to the farm. I mean, because because I heard you in a, giving a TED talk sometime back where you're saying that, you know, for my oxygen, I lived in the city. 
but to connect to the land i lived at the farm very good question there there can be books written about this so the world as we know it today is going through a very um polarized moment in our history food is the one place where we come together uh, left and right democrat and republican uh, congress and bjp and all the other iterations of politics and uh, dividing social constructs that we can think of at the table we forget we are enemies we eat we love common things memories take us to these kinder places where humanity shines and i had i've always had an apartment in new york city but then we went to visit a friend one weekend in 2006 at a bo- at a, at a lake house and we fell in love and we said okay let us get a cottage all of a sudden when charlie and i started talking what we would do with the cottage i said oh mom and dad will come your grandmother and mother will come and uh, bim bissel will come from uh, delhi yogi suri and his wife and kids will come from india it we realized we needed more room so instead of that 600 square feet cottage that our friend had that would have cost 50000 dollars to buy we ended up buying a house worth hundreds of thousands of dollars with 80 acres of land and over 6000 square feet of uh, covered space for people to live wow. so we would we would entertain indian style my father would call it said you're living like a raja maharaja of the past really? untenable unre- unrealistic but enjoy till you can and keep sharing it with family and friends it was magic that most people will never even be able to imagine in their lives but that farm i liked because i had my chickens i always loved animals i ran a, a dispensary for birds from my rooftop in south extension delhi broken birds with little limbs that were twisted or almost near death i would bring them home feed them care for them put scotch tape on their wounds cover them go gorge them and then when they were refined to fly i would let them fly i had 90 pigeons on my rooftop so at the farm i wanted chickens i'd never had chickens so we had 200 chickens we had 100 ducks and geese we had 48 goats we had uh, four dozen alpacas and one llama and a partridge in a pear tree and some pigs as well so the farm was my escape to be with animals for them to treat me like i was nothing to tell me that i was but one dot in the larger scheme of life in manhattan i was with all the egotistical people living the rush of life that you feel oh i'm somebody and so but in manhattan i breath i breathe good oxygen oxygenated air because in manhattan it didn't matter what my coloring was it didn't matter that i spoke with an accent it didn't matter that i had a lisp it didn't matter that my uh, skin color may be a little darker than the other that i may pray to a million gods i was one of many people who were all different at the country in at the farm in new upstate new york i was the other i was this it, i lived in a polarized world of people that had never seen diversity that had never tasted plurality mm-hmm. that had never imagined a world where different people religions languages accents could be one so there i would be called uh, the effing arab the smelly curry man the mm-hmm. uh, idolatrous hindu the heathen that all these things that was new it was they were they weren't mean people they weren't people who were angry or racist or hateful they'd never seen the other they hadn't had the luxury of knowing that the that life could exist in plurality and we could be one e pluribus unum in many we are one that they hadn't they'd seen it perhaps or by maybe in access bad education generational lack of access to a good education had robbed them the ability to think of plurality so there there, there was no modern school where i went to live at the farm there were schools that were broken there were tummies that were hungry there were minds that were deprived there were people who were told it's the world is a christian world the constitution is written by jesus and the 10 commandments dictate how we live in an american culture that was their world so i went to that i so i realized that I, manhattan was oxygen the farm was to enjoy my animals and realize i was nothing but the chicken would come sit on me poop on me bite my ears and give me love without knowing who i was the celebrity the michelin stars the bank accounts nothing mattered to them they were connecting to me as a human being or a but fellow it, being but that is that is truly the way to live i mean that is the, uh, and and if the photographs in the book anyway show it and you're sharing that with every reader throughout but so so um tell us a little bit about life with charlie who's 
who's the american and where's the masala in american masala so the american is uh, my uh, you know for 27 years i've lived in america the last two years i've been trying to live in india so american is who i am because my growing years formative years have all been spent in america that is my nation my country india is my birth country and i am a dhobi ka kutta na ghar ka na ghat ka i am the proverbial uh, uh, washerman's uh, uh, puppy dog that spends all day with the washerman at the ghats where they are washing the clothes at night he goes to sleep with them at their home confused entirely as to where he belongs but i where my when i put my head i belong there so while i was living in america america defined me indian were my roots so that's why the book was called american masala my farm was called american masala farm charlie is my partner is a west virginian who grew up in a big city there huntington and parkersburg to beautiful cities not farms and so he had never been in a farm i had never been in a farm so our coming together as co-hosts and co uh, 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 inhabitants of this home we called it american masala farm but it was a philosophy that guided our lives that we were equal parts indian equal parts american that masala was the spice of life it added that oomph that pizzazz that brilliance that shine that in that something that you can't talk about you know explain but it exists and that's what masala is mirch masala when you make something better than it even is in reality so so what about this uh, journey into books what prompted you to write your first book so as soon as i arrived in india in 1993 uh, people were eating my food when i was just a student going mad for it actresses and actors famous ones from bollywood hollywood coming and eating my food literally wanting me to be their private chefs in fact uh, 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 what's his name uh, uh, tom cruise and his partner another actor whose name i'm forgetting right now they were scientologists they loved my food enough mm-hmm. that they wanted me to become the head chef for the church of scientology and were willing to give me half a million dollars when i was barely 28 to 29 year old to be the uh, chef for the church because it wasn't my good looks it was the food of india and uh, but people would tell me write a book write a book teach a class at 25 uh, i had served a dinner every year in my apart in my apartment in new york city we would do a holiday party where uh, they would uh, uh, we would cook an open house and uh, we would invite anywhere from 50 to 100 people and one year it was i think i was 25 year old so do the math that year we had a dinner we had made 14 cakes from around the world and uh, tandoor on the uh, deck of the apartment with snow falling and a woman came with another friend and her name was carol guber unfortunately she passed away sadly and uh, very young carol was then the director of uh, new york university school of nutrition and food studies she gave me a card and said kiddo call me tomorrow i may have something for you she asked me to become an adjunct professor at nyu teaching at the de- department of nutrition and food studies and i was 25 and the youngest one to get that title i taught there for 5 years and then at 30 i aligned with the culinary institute of america which had uh, affiliation with harvard school of public health and i started teaching there a course called healthy kitchens healthy lives where we teach physicians how to eat and drink and cook and be mindful and so from a young age i'd been teaching and people would tell me write a book i finally agreed in uh, the year 1999 to take that seriously and met uh, the uh, my my editor was pam kraus the most powerful editor at that moment in time she was the editor in chief of uh, clarkson potter and the mouse and she bought my book as her book and i was lucky to have that happen i had the agent who was agents of agents angela miller and we sold the book and they thought it would be the bridge between what india was and india shall be and we've sold over quarter million copies of the book since it got published and the book has become a seminal book for indians who want real serious indian home cooking there's no other book like that because we take indian home cooking seriously in the pages of that book it's about recipes that nani mom dadi neighbor will all say yeah it's just like my mother would cook it it's not fancy food it was everyday cooking that if you're living abroad especially or if you're a newly married couple living in a small town or a big town in india you can pick that book and cook what mom father grandpa would have cooked for you at their home the recipes uh, uh, can be tested they never fail you the photographs match what you'll cook and that hadn't been done till then our books were all 
stories, all myth. The photographs never match what you would cook. So it changed that. Also, it changed for publishing in America. Each recipe came with a note, a story of why that recipe meant something for me. And that I'm told by my publisher. Now the, it's de rigueur. Every book, cookbook written in America now, often yeah. have, the good ones have stories that go with the recipe. This was the first time a poor publisher had to write extra pages for each recipe because I had sometimes 200 words going with the recipe. So more print be, ink being uh, paid for just for the story. They took the risk and that made the book so popular because it, each recipe was connected to a GPS location that touched a person's heart and that heart that was touched then told another person the story of this book and the word of mouth sold it endlessly. And, and that, that really is typically you because you, you made a book which really was not as per existing stereotypes and you started an entire new genre. Now, uh, you know, you, you changed cookbooks for the better. But so in Instamatic, it's a marked departure from a regular, your regular books. And here you, you've actually laid bare your soul. You've shared your inner thoughts with the readers. And uh, it's, it's 80 photographs captured. But uh, this is this, this you started at a time when after you were staying at the farm, you decided you shift back to India. What happened then? There are no answers in the book. It raises questions because that's what I'm doing. I'm questioning myself and the world at large. It was written uh, because of a mad publisher believing in my thoughts and uh, my being. Thank you, my publisher, Yogi, and your lovely wife, Priya, that when I was at my lowest ebb, when I was barely able to live, when I needed help to walk, when I needed uh, uh, people to fill in the gaps in my thought processes and my memory, the, when I couldn't see more than three feet with one eye and, and almost nothing from the other eye, uh, I would take photographs and then with an iPhone that would bring me images of what I was seeing right in front of my eye to connect me to the world. And when I saw those things that I could not see, even being in that space, the phone and that image would tell me what I had been missing or where I was. I thought I was missing, but I right there I was, I was sitting in that spot blind to it, but really living with it. And that's what we humans are. We can be in a place and be oblivious to the wealth that exists around us, waiting for us to discover it, waiting for us to be one with it. Life wants us to live with it rather than in opposition to it. And that the phone, the images that I took while being legally blind, while recovering from a, a TIA, a transient ischemic attack that had left me barely living, those moments taken from an iPhone, the thoughts that came out of my head, typed into the iPhone because I could still type. I couldn't find my name. I couldn't speak too clearly. I couldn't remember many words, but I could still type. And the memory, the words would come into the phone. They wouldn't come into my head. Neurologists can't answer how people with aphasia who can't read, who can't do many things with motor skills can still type because this is a new muscle for the new action for the brain's muscles that the, there's something else guiding our interaction with the phone. So while I couldn't do many other things with my hands, I could still type. And the book was written like that. And you were mad enough to believe in me and mm -hmm. publish that book. So uh, thank you for believing in me. No, I, I, I really, my favorite uh, essay out of the book is Faith, Hope, Courage, Love, which is, uh, you know, uh, I've got it right here. It's long to read out, but that is, pretty much, I would say, the central core of Instamatic and Savir. I mean, he has he has faith in everyone. There's eternal hope. He's always generous. So, so in some part, I wanted to ask you that, did you shape Instamatic or did Instamatic shape you? So, uh, Yogi, I think, see, uh, you were daring enough to buy the book. Love it. But... But what Instamatic comes from is neither you nor me. It is living grounded in the moment, living one with the universe's flow and in being one with true to yourself 
and rising above those uh, polarizing uh, smallnesses of our mind, heart, and being that break us apart and also those around us. So Instamatic is a clarion call from the world as we know it, which is the, in the Vedas, what do they say, Vasudeva Kutum? Uh, so, you know, it's the, uh, in the Vedas we are told, which is so old, as old as time, that we are part of one global village. That if one being, whether it's a butterfly or a, a rabbit, a lion or a human, is aching or crying or hungry or desperate or sad or being uh, killed, we are all being killed. All our souls are being hurt. So I think uh, Instamatic is not from me. It is off me because I've given it some shape and form. But it's a continuum that's part of the world's life and living. And I hope people will read it and then create their own Instamatics. Because it's, it's my way of telling people, never be defeated. Always have faith that their tomorrow will be a day full of hope. And have the courage to believe in that. And love people like they're not your enemies. Give them a chance. Let them be a little rude. But love them back. Show them by loving that they don't need to hate you. Because if we love, love and love, even the haters turn around. So I think faith, hope, courage, love is the message of Instamatic. I had forgotten that I'd even written this chapter. But that's how I look at life, Yogi, that we have to have faith. We have to have faith in having hope. And we have to have the courage to do the two and have the courage to love. When we do that, all that divides us dissipates. And we see the common humanity that exists in all of us. No, very, very, very true. And, and so, and you're a very prolific writer and it's been, you know, it, it, it comes, it, it's so beautifully worded. The foreword was written by Mr. Shashi Tharoor and Doctor, he, Doctor Shashi yeah. Tharoor and the much venerated and and he's he, he's he very aptly described them as pictures and word pictures. Uh, that's a description I just fell in love with because that's that's pretty much the way you write. And uh, um, there's. So, so I, I always felt, you know, your, your writing is like your food. It's sometimes hot. It's sometimes sweet. It's sometimes spicy, uh, sometimes naughty, but completely unapologetic. And as Shashi Taru, Dr. Taru said, often searing because I don't spare myself for other people. I reveal my own failures and I'm happy to uh, reveal others that where we are all failing. I don't, I won't take names in my writing, but I talk about humanity failing itself and others. And so I think if you, if any writing, I'm not writing a book to be loved. I don't write to be, uh, uh, sell a book. I write for me. And I'll tell you, Yogi, what I write is my cathartic therapeutic sessions with a shrink. The shrink is a computer into which I type. And when I've typed my story, I've, I'm released of all the challenges and pains of my life and what I see around. And that's what I do writing for. So I write anywhere from 10 to 18,000 words a day, often gibberish, wow. but it's just cleansing my soul. And it's just saying it's out there. It's written, it's come out of my mind. I won't hate another person because I'm anxious. My, it's my way of getting rid of angst. And uh, it's, it's therapeutic. So, so in Instamatic, you, you know, you shared with us photo essays from around the world, your, your, uh, sight, sound, smells, colors that have touched a chord with you. Uh, life at Manhattan, life at the farm, life in India. So out of all these journeys, uh, have any of these particular essays or imagery inspired any of your cooking? They all, they all have because each moment that I've lived has colored my uh, mind, has scented my food, has nuanced my uh, garnishings and made me more intuitively sensitive to the needs of my guests and made me uh, a better human being so I can be a better chef and a mentor to my cooks in my kitchen. So I think uh, taking one of them isn't uh, all of them have because when I travel, I'm not traveling to go to a restaurant. I'm traveling to see the world. I'm going to see a geography and understand how it ticks. What are the veg vegetables that are growing there? How do people cook for them? Do they look at them and smile? Do they, are they proud of their food? Are they like us Indians who are ashamed of our uh, ghar ka khana? How can we then grow up and have a Michelin guide? We don't have a Michelin guide in India and we don't deserve it. When we are apologetic of our simple home cooking, 
why should the world give us that uh, opportunity so i will go to other cultures to see are they proud of their simple foods are they proud of the great foods they make are they proud of each other are they living in harmony with nature are they uh, ruining it for the others that follow tomorrow so in those journeys i discover food i discover flavor i discover taste and i discover the skills to cook relevantly tomorrow because if you don't think of tomorrow and cook authentically today before yesterday we are still a failure because to be authentic to us in this moment we have to recognize our past have understanding of what tomorrow might be and still be grounded in today so i think that's the dialogue that happens when i travel and i learn about what the future will hold and i smile and absorb what i te- taught in these locales no uh, and and uh... so so you you written a democracy for change in in this book which is uh, you know like does change look like a second generation millionaire from queens is that what i wrote donald trump <laughs> i don't read my own books i you you pick the essays i okay so donald what, what i wanted to ask you was that you know after the bidding victory so the mithai that we distributed is that we made by you oh. <laughs> no it's you know uh, donald trump isn't a, a monolithic person he's not a, a one uh, a person we have many donald trumps they have taken avatars in many different nations democracy very, old very democracies large democracies uh, proud democracies struggling have all taken shapes of dictatorships and fascist regimes in the last several years and so donald trump is emblematic of the problem of humanity and donald trump has come to us and has been broken by us to tell the world watch it will happen to you as well don't chase these demagogues because tomorrow they'll eat you up and i think uh, by, by watching donald trump we are getting lessons in how to live and what not to repeat and what not to follow so he's not alone we have many other we have mini me's of donald trumps across the world in nations as old as the vedas and in nations as young as america we have donald trumps ridden everywhere and that's pretty much the beauty of instamatic you know where you're writing you you're forcing us to rethink you're forcing us to look at because one begins to ignore the everyday so you've captured a insta moment you've brought it up you've spoken about it and just enough it's it's not a lecture it's it's your genuine feeling emotion which is something i really really appreciate thank you so so we have a question by aparna who's asking that if you could uh, choose only three ingredients with which to make a meal which three would you choose love hope and courage but jokes aside <laughs> a good vegetable oil uh, some uh, cumin seeds and i would say uh, perhaps potatoes or tomatoes so either potatoes or tomatoes and with them in many different iterations you can do a lot so i think uh, three ingredients yes i think uh, beautiful oil one amazing vegetable and cumin zira it, it, the khana made with zira is so delicious in its simplicity roasted puree it you can do plenty so toasted cumin uh, fried cumin ground cumin uh, cumin is a wonderful spice because it's as musty as the uh, unshowered armpits of a frenchman in the subway for or it's as uh, deeply seductive as the forest in uh, the spring time so that's the breath it goes so you can go get all the way to this funkiness and you can go to citrusy nuance coriander and cumin are incredible skin zira dhaniya ka khana it's brilliant so coriander cumin vegetable oil and then the vegetables you want to bring to them incredible food can be made so so there's a question from me because you you know you it, to me you pretty much embody the never say die have faith you can you i've seen you turn situations around just on your positive attitude you know like my award for making the best of a bad situation would go to you because something's happened you're going to say no we spin it around guys late doesn't matter we'll catch up somewhere else stuff like that and and you've had enough challenges to go with but my question is have you ever done that in the kitchen set up to bake dum aloo and come out with potato cutlets so i was making a a, a pear chutney in a navy house in washington dc vice president's house and uh, we were i burnt my hand next thing i knew we were distracted about 
taking care of my hands and the chutney was overcooked and burnt. I said, wow, okay. But I saw in the middle of the char, this puddle that was golden. And I'm like, wow, what is that? It looked like the halo of Krishanji in the Mahabharata's depictions. And I'm like, wow. So I pulled that out and the best pear chutney, caramelized pear chutney was in the middle. In the book, American Masala has a recipe for pear chutney that was created by the char, the ashes of the uh, pear chutney I'd set out to make. So in kitchens and as in life, accidents and failures are only accidents and failures because the dictionary and our peer and our elders have told us that they are what they are. But they are lessons that life is teaching us if you're mindful, if you have eyes wide open, ears well listening, there are lessons. And these lessons teach us by uh, action in reality, in practical mode, all that we need to learn about life and cooking and living and sharing. So that's what it is. Of course, I've made plenty in the kitchen and they've all made me a better human being and a chef. How beautifully put. So, so we've got a lot of questions and we're in the last few minutes. So I'm going to... Harriet asking that in artistic passions such as cooking, how does one walk the line between invention and tradition? Does such a line exist? So it's a very, very dangerous line. I think uh, first tradition has to be understood, has to be respected, has to be followed, has to be studied, has to be venerated. When you've learned the traditions, when you've learned the craft, when you've understood what has been done in millennia by all the accidents of people before you, then invention comes to play. And when you invent after having been steeped in tradition, the magic you create becomes a tradition of tomorrow. Otherwise, it's just a failure that nobody else will think relevant. So when you come from tradition and you invent with respect for it, you create tomorrow's masterpieces and classics. And that's how you do it. I think. And Alex is asking that, is there a meal that you've created in this past year, which has brought you comfort and which will be remembered as your go-to pandemic meal? A, a, a few. And, uh, but they were simple. We, we, Charlie and I, Charlie actually made us a chicken rice a recipe from Edna Lewis, who was perhaps the greatest, one of the greatest American chefs. She was a black chef, not given her due in the time she lived, but today she's venerated. He made her chicken and rice. Of course, we masala fried it a little. It's incredibly comforting food. I've made a bhel puri that will be served in my new restaurant when I open it this time next year. I won't go too much into it, but it had me in tears that at 48 years of age, I made a bhel puri that was so beautiful and so pure that I was like, wow. And it was, I've made bhel puris over the years. I've also been chef, uh, served a bhel puri with caviar by Abu Jani and Sandeep in Bombay, which was incredible. But this Bhelpuri had me literally in tears inside my heart saying, I'm proud of you. So the little voice of my uh, own conscience told me I'm proud of me. And that Bhelpuri was perhaps my greatest invention of the pandemic. But the pandemic has brought me closer to myself. And I hope everybody is enjoying cooking at home. And uh, so uh, Roshan's asking many chefs uh, describe cooking as a form of art. Would you agree? And do you think there's a precious aspect of Indian culture that cooking alone can carry forward? I think uh, so. Cooking, of course, is an art form. The culinary arts are perhaps the most essential art form. If you you are what you eat. If you're hungry, you can't think. If you can't think, you don't. You should not live. So you know you're a vegetable. Who wants to enjoy a vegetable that is human? So I think uh, cul the arts, culinary arts, are essential. Uh, Indian food needs to respect its soul, its traditions, its uh, long history. When we invest in them, when we are not shy of them, we're not ashamed of them, that's the day Indian food will come of age and finally become, finally, that cuisine that's the next best cuisine. Since I arrived in 1993 to America, every year they say Indian will be the next big cuisine. It's never become that. When Indians become proud of their own culture and cuisine, Indian cuisine will come of age and become the best thing in the world. So I think uh, we are running out of time. So I just want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor being with you on this journey of Instamatic. Um, and I don't just say this to every best-selling author, amazing master chef, ex restaurateur extraordinaire. Thank but you. And over to Kritika.
Thank you for being the best publisher who gave me a lot of freedom. And thank you, Kritika and the Jaipur Lit Festival for having me. It's been an honor. You all make India proud. Thank you. Thank you, Subhi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yogi, for that lovely conversation. Food truly does bring us all together. Thank you once again, Subhi, for sharing such personal stories of your life with us. It was truly enjoyable. Thank you all for watching and being a lovely audience. Please do buy the books of our speakers that are available through our bookshop, Full Circle. Once again, we'd like to thank all our supporters and partners. We hope you all enjoyed the session and will tune in for our next session. The Bhutto Dynasty, The Struggle for Power in Pakistan. Owen Bennett Jones and Hussein Haqqani in conversation with TCA Raghavan at 11.15 a.m. EST, 8.15 a.m. PST and 9.45 p.m. IST. Thank you once again. And now we present a reading by Vikram Chandra and Jenny Bhatt from the Jaipur Writers Short Series. <laughs> Hi, Vikram. Thank you for joining us today to talk about Granthika. And I'm very excited to learn more about this because it's been described as the writing super app built for writers. And it's an editor, it's a database, it's a timeline maker. It's a lot of things. And from what I've seen and read of it, it's like this linked storage system that you know, dynamically takes all the facts and details about your story and then connects them. So you can see all the timelines and relationships and context for every element of your story. Is that a, is that a correct way of thinking of it? Hi, thanks for uh, chatting with me. And yes, that's exactly right, right? So it, you can think of it like a web or network of knowledge, mm -hmm. right? That, are, uh, that is attached to your manuscript. Um, and so then you can navigate that web in various ways. And, and the, the effort is to make writing easier so you don't spend all your time doing this information management um, and you can concentrate on your writing itself. Great. And, and you know, I've played a little bit with the trial version and I was just thinking when I was doing that, because I've used in the past tools like Scrivener, for example, or Dramatica. Mm -hmm. um, and... So perhaps maybe, could you tell us how Granthika might be different from some of the writing apps that are out there in, in the world today? Great. So uh, both of those are <clears throat> very good tools, but what I found <clears throat> hard to use when I tried using those was that information management was still very difficult, right? So that uh, <clears throat> I, I, in Scrivener, you know, I could keep my notes in one place and then keep my uh, manuscript in one place, but there was no direct connection mm. right, between the two. Um, and so I still had to go finding it um, uh, with Dramatica and Word and other stuff. I, I keep my notes in a note keeping program, but then if I, I literally have like 4,000 notes for my current novel already. And so when I want to fact check something, I have to go and search those, you know, and, and I can't find them. It takes me 20 minutes sometimes to find one note that I took three years ago. Um, yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So what we're trying to do is to uh, make all of that. How does Granthika make the narrative and creative thinking process easier for writers? You know, well, it, because you need you need the UI and UX. And, and for those who don't know, I'm talking about user interface and user experience. Mm -hmm. I personally did not care much for Dramatica's UI UX. And it, it's just too cluttered, too much distraction. So, yeah. So go ahead. We've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And what we want to build is a program that looks simple, but then has depth, mm -hmm. right? That you can start to use very easily, but then reveals um, its intelligence, as so to speak. Can I show you? Sure. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So it looks, of course, like your typical word processor, right? There's mm -hmm. a place where you can edit your manuscript. On the left, there's a table of contents, which is built for writing uh, uh, books with chapters and scenes and so forth. And then across the top here, you've got your various elements of fiction, right? That you can you can navigate um, among. Oh, we were just mentioning train stations. Here's mm -hmm. a location, right? Where you could have put <laughs> your, created your station. You could have written descriptions and notes, um, however many you wanted. Um, and then I'm going to return to the uh, editor. And what happens is 
from this menu, if you choose this, um, do you see those highlights yes. of some words? Mm -hmm. um, so what those are are mentions, just like in Facebook or on Twitter, right? So if I put my cursor within one of those, I press Control M, and I'm right on Sherlock Holmes, oh. right? And then with one keystroke, I'm back where I'm editing, right? So, so the swiftness of moving between those and being able to look at my data and go back and forth. And here, you know, I have a description, I have notes, uh, I have a reference to a website that I might look at later for a chronology of the cases. Uh, this is Hound of the Baskervilles, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then I can attach images as well and mm -hmm. then choose one of them to be the default image. Um, and uh, the, the, for me, for my purposes, keeping a timeline is one of the most difficult things uh, that I find as I go along. Uh, so what you can do is you can create these events. You can say they happened on 26 September 1888 at 10 a.m. Um, and then there is actually a timeline uh, that you can look at, right? Um, and so what happens with this is that I can see in a chronological way how these events relate to one another, right? Uh, and this makes my uh, mornings much happier. Uh, uh, there are various other uh functions uh, or, or um, things that make life easier. If you click in the editor over here, you can, this is what we call the connections panel. And so what you'll notice is that if I change to a different scene, I see different characters, right? So these are all the people, the locations and so forth that are mentioned in this scene right here. If I click on one of them, like Sherlock Holmes, I see then, uh, you know, the, the, the exact places where he's mentioned uh, I can click over here. I can see that the events that he participates in. And then if I click on one of these, I can actually see the event, right? So this is what I meant by going along the web of knowledge that you've created. Um, and so this is called the Knowledge Explorer. Hmm. And then uh, let me close these. And I'll just copy something and paste it from here because I don't want to waste your time watching me type. I can type in queries like this, right? So the scenes containing the Spaniel, right? And every time that the Spaniel is mentioned, you can see where wherever the dog is mentioned in the entire manuscript. And clicking on one of those will take you straight to that scene, mm -hmm. right? So all of these kind of uh, things that might seem little, but in a typical word processor, if you're trying to do this kind of stuff, it's essentially impossible, right? And so right. that's what we've tried to build. No, that, that's helpful because, I mean, for me personally right now, I use a word processor and I use Evernote. So I have to mm -hmm. kind of toggle back and forth and it's not connected, right? So I hear you. Um, so let me ask you my last question then. Um, what's, you know, so you've talked about, uh, you know, on the website, it, it talks about allowing more complex world building through Granthika. There's also something along, I don't know if it's available yet, but about sharing universes across multiple writing projects. And, and so what, in the, in the near term, what might a user, it, you know, what, what could we look forward to expecting in terms of any upcoming new features or functionality? Well, you can already share universes, right? Mm -hmm. So universe meaning, the, like for instance, the entire Sherlock Holmes universe with all the characters and so forth, the events. So you can export to a text file and give it to somebody else and they can import that text file and immediately start working on mm. that same universe. Uh, but the next upgrade to that, which should be fairly soon, will be through a web version mm. and through coordinated sharing, right? So that you can work on the same universe at the same time instead of having to export and import on the other end. So then you can actually collaborate with other people, right? And then you can then, you know, your your first reader, third reader, your editors can see what you're working on. Um, they can leave you notes and so forth. So all of that is in the pipeline. And the web thing, I believe, is in the three-month future um, uh, timeline. So fairly soon, we're, we're releasing new features like every week. Oh, I forgot to show you the board, which was, <laughs> uh, which was the big feature for this week. Shall I do it? I don't sure, know. If yeah, please right. do. Please do. OK. So. So this is what we're work, we're working on. And so you see how this, what this looks like? So mm -hmm. if you ever worked in film, you'll see filmmakers do this all the time. They stick up 
uh, index cards, right, on the wall. Um, and then this is actually a more um, useful uh, uh, view of it, in my opinion, where you see each chapter and all the scenes within it, right? And so you can navigate from left to right and see your entire manuscript, as it were, uh, within the space of Granthika. Uh, so you could, you people can actually write film scripts with this too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You could write film scripts. If you're working on a long form series, you could do the episode structure, uh, anything that you want, essentially, that is in the way of narrative. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I would call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living library or perhaps even a library of life. Do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue, of the adventures of science, of the joys of poetry and music, the consolations of philosophy, the sense of literature and of life. about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics. It's meaningful. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF co coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that People at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada.